Okay, as promised, we are starting our lectures a little bit late. Um, this is why um, I am extending the um, due dates for a lot of the, for, for the uh, assignments underneath the blood. So this is gonna be our first lecture on the cardiovascular system. So there's actually three. Uh, the cardiovascular system is uh, broken up into three lessons. The first is gonna be on the blood. The second will be on the heart exclusively, and the third is going to be on uh, blood vessels. So this one is about blood. So first, our overview of blood is, uh, for those of you who took Bio 201, and we talked about the different types of tissue types that we find in um, humans, uh, we categorized blood as a connective tissue. And it's the only fluid connective tissue. And it's kind of weird to think of it as a connective tissue because we often think of connective tissues or as things such as cartilage and bone, um, structural, more structural kind of um, components that make up the body. However, the main uh, definition of a connective tissue is that it, um, originally um, derived from mesenchymal cells um, during fetal development. So blood is going to arise from these um, fetal stem cells. So they, it is grouped in um, as a connective tissue. If you didn't learn this in 201 or you haven't taken 201, don't worry. Um, you'll learn it when you take 201 next semester. But at this time, just remember that blood is categorized as a connective tissue. Another thing that connective tissues have is that they are made up of um, cells. Uh, they are also made up of ground tissue and fibers. And together the ground tissues and fibers are called extracellular matrix. So if we look at the blood, the cell parts of the blood um, include the formed elements. So that's going to be our red blood cells um, which pictured in, let me get a little um, laser pointer. Pictured here, this is our red blood cells, our white blood cells, this is our white blood cells, and then our platelets. And we're gonna spend most of this chapter actually talking about the characteristics of these different formed elements or cells. The second portion of the connective tissue, which collectively is called the extracellular matrix, it's made up of the uh, fibers, and also uh, the ground substance. In blood, that extracellular matrix is gonna be the plasma. And the plasma is the liquid portion of the blood in which all of these formed elements, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets are going to travel. So blood has lots of different functions. Uh, the first function that people think of mostly is that it works for transport. So that's gonna be transport of nutrients. It's gonna pick up nutrients um, from our intestines as we digest our food and distribute those nutrients to all the cells of the body. It also is gonna transport gases. Um, the main two are going to be oxygen, oxygen from the lungs uh, transported to the body tissues and carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide picked up in the body tissues and then dropped off in the lungs. Based on the lesson that we just had um, previously, we also now know that blood is going to function in the transport of hormones. And uh, the blood is also going to pick up cellular waste, cellular waste that is in the interstitial tissues. It's gonna transport that cellular waste to the kidneys and the kidneys are gonna filter the blood and get rid of those wastes. The blood also functions in defense. So those white blood cells that travel in the plasma are going to protect the body from external threats. So I have written here um, bacteria, but I also could have put viruses, any kind of foreign object that gets, in with, gets within our body um, is going to uh, have to deal with, uh, sooner or later, the white blood cells that are found in the blood. White blood cells are also going to protect us from internal threats. Uh, for instance, uh, there are specific white blood cells that are, um, uh, their sole purpose is to uh, kill cells that have a malformed DNA 
or in that case, you know, if we want to look at it that way, um, cancer cells. Uh, cancer cells, um, cancer is a type of, or, or what happens when cells uh, have some sort of genetic flaw in them and they start reproducing unchecked. And so there are certain white blood cells that are able to recognize these uh, genetically defective cells, even though they, you know, originated as cells within us and they take them out. You may have heard of a lot of things about like immunotherapy drugs for uh, cancer patients. Um, immunotherapy drugs are, are wonderful, um, a development in cancer treatment because immunotherapy drugs actually help your own immune system to fight the cancerous and the uh, genetically defected cells in your body, which is wonderful because versus chemotherapy, which uh, non-discriminately um, targets any kind of fast uh, replicating cell, uh, immunotherapy is going to target the cancer cells alone. These white blood cells also protect us from internal threats such as virus infected cells. So a way that our body is affected by a virus is that a virus enters us, it you know, kind of attaches to cells, it ejects its own DNA inside the cell, it takes over the cell um, uh, and uses the cell kind of as its machinery to reproduce more viruses. So a cell that has been infected by a virus is going to um, look differently to the white blood cells than a non-infected viral, uh, viral cell, uh, or should I say a cell infected by a virus. And so white blood cells are gonna uh, take these guys out too. So another way of it, protecting us from internal threats. Also white blood, uh, also our blood has platelets in it. Um, the platelets are there to help protect against blood loss. And we'll talk about this a lot more at the end of this lesson when we talk about how the body uh, forms a blood clot, stops bleeding and helps trigger the repair of tissue. Blood helps with the maintenance of homeostasis. This is a big one we talked about in our last chapter, but again, it comes up. Um, it's gonna keep coming up again and again. Um, the blood is going to help maintain uh, homeostasis by regulating body temperature. Uh, think about when you get really, really hot. If you go outside and you start running, what happens? Your skin becomes very, very red. Why? Because all of the blood is traveling to the surface of your skin so that the excess heat can be radiated off of your body. Um, the opposite happens when you go outside and you get really, really cold. What happens? Your, your hands get very, very white. Um, the reason why is because the blood is pulling towards the core of your body uh, to keep your organs warm and um, uh, protected. Uh, you know, you can live um, without a finger or toe. And it might not be, be very happy about living without a, a finger or toe, but you can still live. But it, you can't really live without, um, you know, your liver, your heart. It's important to keep those warm and at the correct temperature so that they don't um, succumb to a lower temperature. Blood also helps maintain, has what is referred to as a blood buffer system that's gonna help regulate the pH of the body. So the pH of the blood is between 7.35 and 7.45, and it's kept there at a very um, steady range. Um, there is a blood buffer system in play that if the um, pH starts to rise, there are bicarbonate ions that are going to attach to those free hydrogen ions to bring the pH uh, back down, up, back to, I'm sorry, back up to a more normal range. Uh, the opposite happens also if um, the uh, pH uh, rises a bit, then um, carbon dioxide actually is involved in the blood buffer system, which we'll talk about um, after when we talk about the kidneys. Um, the uh, Carbon dioxide, when it dissolves in the plasma, um, actually will disassociate and form carbonic acid, and the carbonic acid then can release uh, free hydrogen ions to uh, bring the pH level back down to a normal rate. And it does this um, very efficiently because there is a very small range in which the pH will be. This is what I always find funny about um, the sign up. So uh, I love going to like, health food stores and well I like going to health food stores because I like to eat like weird food but um 
I know one big thing is like selling, they sell water, like alkaline water, it's better for you and stuff like that, you know. Oh, what is your body's pH level? Um, yeah, your body's pH level is not going to be affected by a $10 bottle, ten bottle of water that you drink. It's not because your body has a natural system built in place already that is going to make your blood stay within that small 73.35 to 7.45 range. And because of that, it's also going to keep your tissues within a certain range also. If your blood um, becomes more uh, basic or acidic, you have a major problem. Uh, and a major problem that a $10 bottle of alkaline water is not going to solve. I mean, major problem like you are going to be in the hospital and an intensive care problem. That being said, if you like spending $10 for a bottle of um, alkaline water, by all means do so. And if you have an extra $10 to do so, or you think it tastes good, go ahead. If you like it, get it. Is it gonna do anything? No. So, uh, you know, save yourself the money and just buy regular water or if it's safe, drink it out of the tap. Uh, blood is also going to regulate water content of the body cells. And it does this because of the fact that in the plasma, there are lots of proteins that are um, circulating that contribute to what is referred to as osmotic pressure. And remember, osmosis is the movement, diffusion of water through a semi-permeable membrane. And so water is easily um, able to leave and re-enter um, the very porous capillaries. And the proteins within the blood plasma set up a, a concentration gradient, which will um, either force water to leave the capillary or force water to enter the capillaries. And we will talk more about that when we actually talk about the blood vessels because we'll, we'll get more into how um, nutrient and gas exchange occurs um, in the capillary regions. So if we were to look at blood, um, blood has these different components. So we, it has the uh, cells that are in it, which are, I said were made up of the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. And then we have the serum, which is kind of the fluid portion that is uh, in the, the cells and all these plasma proteins, these uh, plasma proteins I just talked about are gonna be suspended. But doesn't look like that. You know, when, it look, when you look at blood, you think of blood as being just a red liquid. So here we have two vials. So here we have a vial of blood that has uh, just newly been taken from someone. And it has this nice uniform red color. And the reason why it looks like that right now is because right now all of the individual cells and little proteins are evenly distributed throughout the plasma liquid. Now, if we were to put that test tube into a centrifuge, and spin it, what's gonna happen is that as it centrifuges, the heavier item, the heavier components of that blood are gonna to fall towards the bottom of the tube. The lighter ones are gonna be at the top. Why does it do that? Well, if you've ever been on a, um, what it's called the scrambler, like there's rides at the music park where they go around real fast, well, what happens? Well, everything, gets pushed out towards the side. Um, and you, you know, whoever's on the outside is winds up getting squished and you hope that the person on the outside is the uh, heavier person and never put the heavier person on the inside. It's gonna, the poor skinny small person will get squished up. But same purpose with the centrifuge. As it goes like this, um, the uh, things get pushed to the side and what's gonna move faster is gonna be the heavier items. And as they move, they um, form this kind of um, strata layer once the blood has been centrifuged. And what we see is that the heavier items are going to be at the bottom and the lighter items are going to be at the top. And what we see at the bottom portion are going to be the heaviest component of the blood, and that is going to be the red blood cells. So looking at this here, um, this is everything, you know, before it was separated based on density or weight. This is afterwards. So this whole portion down here is now just made up of 
or mostly made up of just the red blood cells. There's a tiny layer right here and it's very small and you can't see it in this picture. Um, if you see it in real life, that tiny layer right there is, is um, kind of like a whitish coating and it almost like lays right on top of the surface of the red blood cell, the red, the red blood cell layer. And then we have this portion up here that is clear, it's like yellowish color. Well, this is the plasma portion. So you can actually look at this and use this as a gauge of the percentage of red blood cells um, in a blood sample. So if we measure the volume, we take the volume of the total, and then we take the volume of just the red blood cells, we can figure out what percentage of the original volume was just red blood cells. And there's a term for this called the hematocrit. So hematocrit is a measure, measures the percentage of red blood cells in a blood sample. Now, for males and females, it's a little bit different. For males, the hematocrit is about 47% of the volume. And for females, it is about 41%. And there's two reasons why. The first reason why is because uh, testosterone, as I mentioned in the last lesson in the endocrine system, is going to have a small role in boosting red blood cell production. And as we know, males have a higher testosterone level than females. So males are going to have naturally a higher volume of red blood cells than females. That is the main reason. The second reason why males have a higher red blood cell count than females do is because females are going to undergo monthly um, during their you know, reproductive years menstruation. And that is going to cause a little bit small, tiny difference in um, the amount of red blood cells that males and females have. A majority of the dif dif difference is due to the different uh, testosterone levels. All right, so the bottom portion, this dark portion is the red blood cells. If you measure that volume and compare it to the total volume of the original blood, you're going to get um, a measurement called the hematocrit. The second portion you really can't see in this picture, and it's very small. It's actually composed as less than 1% of the entire volume, and it's called the buffy coat. And um, I, I don't know why it's called a buffy coat. I'm guessing because, um, you know, like when the ocean comes in and you get like that kind of white foamy buffy layer, um, it does kind of look like that. Um, and it's very, very small. In fact, um, if you hold a blood tube like this and you look like this, you may not be able to see it. But if you look like that and you kind of look at the top of the red blood cell layer, um, there's kind of like this very thin um, white coating. And that is going to be the buffy coat. And this is going to be composed of the platelets and also the white blood cells. So together, the platelets and the white blood cells um, are going to make up less than 1% of the volume of the entire blood. And they are going to be laying right on top of the red blood cells because um, as far as their density is concerned, they weigh much less than the red blood cells themselves. The next layer, and this is a this is a drawing, and it um, uh, you know it it gives you you know um, artist rendition of what it's supposed to look like. So here we have our red blood cell. This little portion here, they draw it in white, and again, it is whitish. Um, it, unless someone has like a huge infection or something like that, and their white blood cell count is crazy. Um, it's not going to be visible that much from the side as it would be from just the top. But the top portion here, or what we saw here, is going to be composed of the plasma. And the plasma is a yellow fluid um, in which all of the formed elements, white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, um, also other things that we are gonna talk about, um, such as nutrients and stuff like that, are going to be suspended. Um, 
If you look at the difference between the plasma volume of the males and females, females have more plasma. They have about 59% of the volume of their blood is plasma. In males, it's 53%. Why is there a difference? Well, if the males have more red blood cells, well, then this is gonna uh, bring down the volume of the plasma. Now, in addition to the plasma being um, where the formed elements are gonna be suspended, the plasma is also um, well, it's made up mostly of water. It's like 92% water, um, but it's also going to contain um, proteins. We'll talk about some of these proteins. Um, these are the proteins. Some of these proteins are going to contribute to um, that osmotic pressure that I was talking about. Uh, it's going to contain nutrients, amino acids, vitamins, nutrients, minerals that were uh, picked up in the digestive system. Um, hormones are going to travel um, in this plasma. Um, also, we're going to find things like if you're taking any kind of medication, the medication is going to be found in the plasma or the metabolites are going to be uh, of the medication is going to be found in the plasma. Now, I just want to uh, point out here, um, this is a good example of a way that the hematocrit um, measurement is being used. This is a normal blood um, of the hematocrit's hematocrit. Um, so you can see we have that 47, 45, 45% depending on if you're male or female. If you were suffering from anemia, and anemia is going to be uh, there's several different types of anemia, but um, anemia can be a, uh, one of them can be a very low red blood cell count. And you can see here how uh, when this blood was centrifuged, we have way less red blood cells in um, circulation and a majority of the volume of the blood is, is being taken up with that plasma. Um, that can also swing the other way. This is called py polycythemia. And this is when someone produces too many red blood cells, which also can be a problem. And we can see that uh, the hematocrit levels are elevated, way higher than they should be. And here we have less um, plasma present. Um, there is another term that I want to make you aware of called the packed cell volume or the PBC. And this is the volume of erythrocytes after centrifuga centrifugation. So after the blood has been centrifuged, um, that uh, volume um, or the percentage of the volume of the red blood cells um, is gonna be the PCV. Uh, and again, normal blood is about 45%. Again, it's gonna be a little bit high for males, a little bit lower, uh, a little bit closer to that 45 for females. Um, you may see PVC written on um, medical charts, or you may be sent, if you have to go get a blood test, that might be one of the blood tests that they're doing. Um, it's just gonna make sure that your red blood cell count level is normal. And of course that has a lot of effect on your body because the red blood cells are gonna be responsible for carrying oxygen. So that's going to have a lot of effect on all of the cells of your body. Some characteristics of blood. So blood clogger. So um, blood, red blood cells have in them, um, and the technical term for a red blood cell, by the way, is erythrocyte. In fact, anything that is E-R-Y-T-H means red. Um, so whenever you see that in a word, um, it's the Latin, um, you know, it's, it's, it's derived from the Latin word for red, erythro, erythro. So uh, for instance, um, if you have um, red swollen skin, it's called um, erythema, oh, I just had on the tip of my tongue, I forget. Um, erythema, erythema, E-R-Y-T-H-E-M, I A erythema and erythra means red. So erythrocyte and cyte C Y T E means cell. So essentially in Latin, erythrocyte means red cell. All right. So erythrocytes are red blood cells, and they are um, going to be the cells of the component of the blood that are responsible for carrying oxygen. Um, and other gases also will carbon dioxide. And the reason they're able to do so is because of this very important um, molecule that is inside of them. It's a protein molecule called hemoglobin. 
And hemoglobin, we're going to talk about the structure a little bit more, uh, a little further on, has in it these pigments that are called heme. There's four hemes in one molecule of hemoglobin. And these hemes um, are going to produce that red color. And based on whether or not there is a high or low oxygen saturation or um, oxygen attached to the hemoglobin, uh, that color is going to vary a bit. Um, it's going to be a bright, bright red, bright, bright red. I'm talking like red, bright red lipstick um, when it is carrying oxygen. When hemoglobin is not totally saturated by oxygen, it's going to be a little bit of a darker red, more of like a vampire-y kind of red. Now, a lot of people say, oh, well, I thought blood was blue if it's not carrying oxygen. Because when you look at your arm, you can see your veins and they're blue. Well, no, that's not true. The reason why you can see your veins appear to be blue uh, is because um, the light waves that are able to penetrate <laughs> Um, deep where your veins are located in your skin, um, that reflection um, is viewed as blue. Your blood is not blue. Your blood is not blue. It's not blue. I used to think it was when I was real little, um, you know, someone told me, well, you know, when your blood doesn't have oxygen in it, it's blue. And I always thought, well, how do they know that? Because as soon as it would be exposed to the air, it would turn red, wouldn't it? Well, it's not, it's red. It's darker red when it doesn't have oxygen. It's a lighter red when it has um, oxygen attached. Now, that being said, there are organisms that live on Earth that do have blue blood. Um, um, what are they called? The um, horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs have blue blood. Um, in fact, their blue blood is that color because they don't have heme in their hemoglobin. They have another pigment in their hemoglobin, uh, in their, well, it's not called hemoglobin because hemoglobin is called hemoglobin because it has heme in it. But their molecule that attaches the oxygen does not have heme in it. It has another pigment, and I can't remember what the name of it is, but that pigment is blue. Um, so if you wanna see that, Google um, horseshoe crab blood. And in fact, horseshoe crab blood is very, very expensive because it is used as an anti-cancer drug. And their people, their whole job is just to like capture horseshoe crabs and like take uh, like a minuscule, like a, a quarter of a milliliter of blood out of them. And then they have to release them. And like, it's insane. The, the, the price of like a liter of um, this uh, horseshoe crab blood is, is crazy. Like you could buy like a house with it. Um, and it's blue, it's, it's, it's a blue color. So if you wanna see what that is, but we, not blue, it's red no matter what. Blood has a higher viscosity of water. So what is viscosity? So viscosity is the measure of a fluid's thickness or its resistance to flow. So think of the difference between if you would take water and you would pour it out of a cup and syrup and pour it out of a cup. A syrup has a higher viscosity. It is a thicker fluid. Um, and if you pour water out of a cup, it's gonna come out very quickly. If you try to pour syrup out, it takes a little while. To, you think about ketchup too. It takes a while to like get down there, you know, blah, 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 very, very slow. So blood is five times more viscous than water. Not as viscous as syrup and not as viscous as ketchup, but it is five times more viscous. The reason why it is more viscous than water is because it contains plasma proteins. And the main reason why is because it, it contains red blood cells. So the plasma itself is actually made up of 92% water but um, we have all these other things dissolved in that watery plasma, which uh, adds to the viscosity. And red blood cells, in fact, um, add greatly to the viscosity. Um, if you have um, a lot more red blood cells in circulation, um, that um, what, I, what I just talked about, which was the hypocythemia, um, it can actually be a problem because the blood is more viscous than it is normally and it, and it, it um, interferes with proper blood flow. 
Um, this can be one of the problems when someone becomes severely dehydrated, because if you come, become severely dehydrated, where's most of that water going to, a lot of that water is going to come from out of the blood. It's going to be removed from the blood. We talked in um, the endocrine system about the volume of blood um, being affected by the amount of water that was in the blood. We also talked about the volume of blood um, affecting blood pressure. Well, so does the blood's viscosity. So when the blood has an increased viscosity, it ha you are going to um, encounter increased blood pressure. Well, why? Because it's going to take a lot more for that blood to travel through a enclosed vessel. So think about it if you have, a, have a, a, a drink, okay, and you put a straw in there and you um, suck up water through the straw. It doesn't take a lot of pressure to get water or even soda up through that straw. Water's not very vis viscous, soda's not very viscous. All right, now let's say we put in that cup a milkshake. Milkshake, it's more viscous, right? You try to pour out a milkshake, yeah, it's going to come out, but it might come out a lot slower than it's going to um, if it was water. Well, if you put that straw, same straw in the milkshake, you're going to have to, you know, suck in a lot stronger to get that milkshake up the straw. You have to increase the pressure to get that milkshake to move into the straw. Same thing with blood. The less viscous it is, the less pressure is needed to move that blood. The less viscous the, the drink is, water, the less pressure you have to pull to get it to come up that straw. The more viscous the fluid, the more viscous the blood, the more pressure the body's gonna need to have it go through the vessels. The more viscous the milkshake, the more pressure you're gonna have to suck uh, or produce to get that um, milkshake to move up the straw. All right, other characteristics of blood, blood pH. I already mentioned that blood pH is um, normally between 7.35 and 7.45. Um, the average is 7.4. Um, and this is going to be regulated by a blood buffer system inside the blood that is going to regulate pH. And we'll talk about this um, in another chapter where we talk about um, pH and I think it's like, fluids and body pH. It's right after we talk about the kidneys or the urinary system. Other characteristics of blood is blood volume. Adult males are gonna have a little bit more blood, five to six liters uh, versus adult females, four to five liters. You're probably saying to yourself, well, how many, what's the volume of a liter? You know, well, this is a liter bottle, two liter of a soda. Um, there are 3.8 liters in a gallon. So adult females have a little bit more than a gallon um, and the max amount, I mean, even an adult male, a max, uh, it would be like what, like almost uh, six, seven, almost um, eight liters is two gallons. Uh, so um, adult males don't have um, up two gallons of blood. So, so realistically, we don't really have that large amount of blood volume, um, which, you know, I'm a big horror film kind of <laughs> dork, so, or like uh, uh, action film, you know, especially um, like um, Kung Fu movies or, you know, uh, Asian, you know, sword fighting movies when, you know, they get cut this blood, which, you know, it goes everywhere. Um, yeah, you don't have that much blood. Um, which <laughs> some of the blood that you see in like horror films are just like blood everywhere. There's, there's not like that much blood uh, in a person. Although, you know, if you do, would pour out like a gallon of blood on the ground, uh, you know, it's gonna make a mess anyway. But um, it's alarming if you think about it, that you, you only have like a gallon of blood. Some, some people, you know, smaller females, which it's not a huge amount of blood, especially if you think about someone having a, a uh, traumatic injury, like that's all they have. So it's not as much blood as you would think that they have. All right, let's talk about our first individual component. Let's talk about 
our blood plasma. So up here we have some pictures of plasma. Uh, you can um, donate plasma, um, specifically just plasma, um, and that's because in the plasma there's going to be the platelets and uh, lots of times white blood cells are stayed in there, uh, are kept in there, um, nutrients, clotting factors, um, especially people who um, have certain disorders like hemophilia where they don't have clotting factors and they can't um, coagulate their blood, um, need constant infusions of uh, plasma. Um, a lot of times you can donate just your plasma which they kind of like take your blood out and it goes to this machine and it spins the blood and it gives you back your red blood cells and it keeps the plasma. Um, or even when you do donate your blood, um, they will um, separate it into its uh, individual components. So as I've said several times before, the blood plasma is gonna be comprised, comprised mostly of water. It's about 92% water, but dissolved um, or suspended. And I say dissolved or suspended because some of the um, electrolytes like sodium, calcium are going to be considered being dissolved where the cells and hormones are gonna be referred to as being suspended. Um, within the plasma, we have uh, plasma proteins, there's three major groups of plasma proteins, and we'll talk about those. We also have our formed elements, our red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and then we have solutes such as the electrolytes. Uh, we talked about blood calcium levels, blood sodium levels, blood potassium levels in the endocrine system. These are some of the electrolytes that you're going to find um, traveling in the plasma. Dissolved gases. Uh, most of your oxygen is going to travel in the blood attached to the hemoglobin in the red blood cells, but some of that oxygen is going to be dissolved in the blood plasma. Carbon dioxide is the opposite. Some of it is going to travel attached to the hemoglobin, but a majority of the carbon dioxide that travels in the blood is going to be dissolved in the plasma. Organic nutrients, amino acids, carbohydrates, glucose, uh, lipids, all of those are going to uh, travel in the plasma, and also metabolic wastes, things, um, waste products that the cells are producing that are going to be taken up in the capillaries. Uh, remember, the plasma is going to go through the kidneys, just, you know, because it's a component of the blood, it's going to be uh, filtered out, and those metabolic wastes are going to be removed. So now let's talk about the three groups of plasma proteins. Um, and I'm saying these are the three major groups of plasma proteins, not that there are other, type, not other types of proteins that are in the blood, but these are our three major players. The first ones are going to fall within the group called albumins. Um, so albumins are going to be the most abundant plasma proteins. And albumins act as binding proteins. They are going to bind to certain things like fatty acids and steroid hormones. And they're going to help the fatty acids and steroid hormones uh, circulate in the plasma. Now, why would they need to do that? Well, what do we know about fatty acids and what do we know about steroid hormones? Well, steroid hormones are lipid soluble. Fatty acids are a lipid. So what do we know about lipids or fats? Well, they don't dissolve well in water. And what is plasma? 92% water. So because these are fat or lipid based products, they're going to need a little bit of help trans, um, um, circulating, sorry, in the plasma. And so to do this, they're going to bind to these proteins in order to give them a, help, um, a helping hand. Albumins are also going to be the most significant contributor to that osmotic pressure of the blood that I talked about. Remember, osmosis is the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane, and it's, from, it's based on concentration gradients. And these uh, plasma proteins, these albumins, are going to build up a concentration gradient inside the vessels um, of a high protein count versus 
outside the vessels. And since protein is not able to move through the capillaries, what we see happening is that water is going to be pulled inside of the vessels. Again, um, I just want you to remember now that these albumins are responsible for those osmotic pressure in the blood. Um, we will talk more, much more about how this happens when we talk about uh, blood vessels and how um, it affects or these osmotic um, pressures affect the movement of fluids inside and outside of the capillaries. The next group are the globulins, and globulins are the second most prominent or common plasma uh, protein. And first we have the alpha and beta globulins. So the alpha and beta globulins are also sorry, are all going to both going to be responsible for transporting iron. Again, lipids and fat soluble vitamins. Again, why? Well, lipids and fat soluble vitamins are lipid based, fat based. They're not going to dissolve very well in water. So they're going to need to hitch a ride in that very watery plasma. Their choice, their choice is uh, alpha and beta uh, globulins. You know, they get a choice between, you know, albumins. AKA Uber and alpha and beta globulins, AKA Lyft. So there are some that prefer the albumins, there's some that are prefer the alpha beta globulins. Um, these guys are also going to contribute a small amount to the osmotic pressure within the vessels. But when I say a small amount, um, when we actually talk about this physiological principle, we're not even really gonna mention globulins. We're just gonna mention the albumins. There's also gamma globulins, and gamma globulins also are called antibodies, or they're referred to as immunoglobulins. So these um, gamma globulins are actually going to be part of our immune system. They're not white blood cells, but they are produced by white blood cells. When we talk about white blood cells, there's several different types of white blood cells, but there's one particular type of white blood cell called a B lymphocyte. Now, a B lymphocyte is going to be involved in a particular type of immunity where the B lymphocyte is going to uh, produce a cell called a plasma cell. And the plasma cell then is going to be responsible for producing an antibody. And these antibodies then are going to circulate in our blood uh, and they are there in order to um, be early recognizers of um, specific foreign particles in the body. So you have probably heard of antibodies before, probably a lot more lately because of the coronavirus. So what an antibody does is that an antibody is going to be created or formed in the body against a specific foreign object. So say you are infected with COVID. All right, so you're infected with COVID and it takes a while for your body to figure out what in the world's happening. Um, by the time it figures out what's, what's happening, you know, you're, you're pretty sick. But once it starts figuring out what is happening and what it's being attacked by, it is going to start to produce these antibodies. The white blood cells, the B lymphocytes are gonna be involved in this process. And ultimately the B lymphocytes are gonna produce antibodies against COVID. Specifically, I'm talking about COVID-19. All right, so you're, you're, you're very lucky and you finally um, recover from COVID, but now you have these antibodies circulating in your blood. So now you are in a pretty good situation because when you come, if you come in contact with another person and they, you know, infect you with the COVID virus, the COVID virus will enter your body and it'll immediately start to try to reinfect you. But what happens is that your body has these antibodies and these antibodies immediately recognize this COVID feller. They're like, oh, it's been here before. We know who you are. We know what you do. Uh-uh, not this time. And they are going to be able to, you know, tag the COVID virus infected cells and say, uh -uh, we need to get these guys out here ASAP so that we don't become ill again. 
So essentially what antibodies do is they don't prevent you from becoming infected again because you can get infected by it. it prevents you from succumbing to that infection because it takes care of and it gets rid of that um, uh, pathogen before it has time to take over um, and infect so many cells that you start to have those symptoms of being ill again, it protects you. Now, the reason why, for instance, um, for the COVID vaccine, you need to get two shots is because you're gonna get the first shot and it's going to give you the antibodies and the antibodies are going to you know uh, circulate for a while but then after a while the antibody levels are going to go down because unless they are triggered by another infection you know they're like oh well, do we really need to make more of these guys now if you get a second shot and you are re you know infected shall we say those antibodies were like oh crap this is what we've been waiting for and they're going to boost up um, production again. And that boost of production um, kind of brings you up to a level that will keep you safe for an elong elongated period of time. Now, I just went through all of that. <laughs> Sorry. That's not really what we're talking about. We're actually going to talk about this when we talk about the immune system. But what I'm saying is that these antibodies that are in circulation, they are a type of gamma globulin, which is one of the three main types of plasma proteins that we find in our plasma. And again, since I went through a lot of that whole thing, um, it's involved in immunity. The last type of uh, plasma protein that we see in our blood is the fibrinogen. Um, fibrinogen is gonna be the least abundant plasma protein. Um, it's formed in the liver, but it is very essential. It's gonna be essential for blood clotting. Uh, fibrinogen is an inactive form of this uh, protein. And during um, a process that we'll talk about called hemostasis, where um, a, a series of events occur for blood to clot to stop bleeding in like a breached or a damaged vessel, the inactive fibrinogen is going to be converted into an active form called fibrin. And that fibrin is going to allow for blood clots to form. Now, why don't we just have fibrin, you know, you know circulating through our blood? Well, that's not a good idea because fibrin is going to cause blood clots. So if fibrin was, you know, flowing through our blood at any point in time, we could just have like a blood clot form and not good because blood clots are what can lead to stroke, heart attack, embolisms, death. So if it's circulated in an inactive form in the form of fibrinogen, um, it is much safer for everyone. All right, we're just gonna start this and then um, about the formation of um, blood cells. So the production of formed elements, the general term for the production of any type of formed elements, so this includes the reds, white, red blood cells, the white blood cells, and also the platelets, is called hemopoiesis. So when someone talks about hemopoiesis, they are talking about the production of any three of those cells. There is a specific name for just the production of red, white, or platelets. So hemopoiesis, production of formed elements of the blood. All of the red blood cells, all of the white blood cells, and all of the platelet cells are going to originate from one type of stem cell called a hemopoietic stem cell. Hemo for blood, um, po, P-O-I-E means the formation of, so hemopoietic stem cell. It's also sometimes called a hemocytoblast, but I believe for our purposes, I've always referred to it as a hemopoietic stem cell. So these hemopoietic stem cells are gonna be a type of stem cell that is located in the bone marrow that is gonna be responsible for the production of all of the formed elements. And for those of you who have heard of the term stem cell, but you're like, oh, stem cell, yeah, you know, but never have really uh, looked into what a stem cell is. A stem cell is a type of cell that can produce different types of cells. And think of it as a tree. So um, uh, they should really call it a branch cell or a trunk cell, but stem cell. Um, so if you have a stem cell, um, 
what you can have is if that one particular cell is um, subjected to a specific type of hormone or specific type of uh, chemical, when that stem cell um, divides, that one of those cells that were produced, because we have our um, parent cell, parent stem cell, and then that stem cell divides, now we have two daughter cells. One of those daughter cells are going to go on to produce another type of cell. So in the case of the hemopoietic stem cell, a hemopoietic stem cell divides. Um, the, one of those hemopoietic stem cells is going to encounter the hormone um, erythropoietin that we talked about. Erythropoietin, remember, um, produced in the kidneys and it causes the form, uh, pushes the formation of red blood cells. So one of those hemopoietic stem cells is um, uh, introduced to erythropoietin. And now one of those stem cells is gonna have the ability to go forward and divide and form new red blood cells. So a stem cell is just kind of a blank slate. It has the ability to form a whole bunch of different types of cells. And this is why um, stem cell research, there's always like a, you know, oh, stem cell research, and there's always a hot bu uh, top button topic um, because um, there are certain cells in our body that once they're formed and if they're ever damaged, they can't repair themselves. Well, where did those cells come from from, uh, from the start? Well, they came from stem cells. So if you go back to the original stem cell or you get these original stem cells, there is a chance that you might be able to program them to form or fix the cells that cannot fix themselves or repair themselves. That was a really bad explanation. Let me say it again. All right, so we all know like nerve cells, spinal cord injuries, you're screwed, all right? Once your spinal cord is toast or damaged, there's nothing you can do about it. Well, where did those original spinal cell, um, cord, spinal cell cord cells come from? Well, they came originally from some sort of stem cell. So if you can take that stem cell and you can in, you know, use it and program it to produce new nerve cells, well, then you can take those new nerve cells and use it to fix the damaged um, spinal cord. So that is probably the context in which you have heard stem cells because um, when we are forming in utero, we are essentially just a ball of stem cells because that one cell that is formed when the egg and the sperm fuse together is going to be responsible for the production of all the cells that you see here right now, right? So um, those are really, really unique and powerful cells because they are blank slates, they haven't been programmed to do anything specific or be any type of particular cell. Um, so, uh, I mean, they have the potential of being like wonderful, but then of course it's very controversial because the um, easiest way to get stem cells is through fetal tissue. And that's a big, you know, problem uh, issue with um, certain groups of people. So I'm way going off the top. Let me get back home to the blood stream. Sorry. Okay. So this hemopoietic stem cell is going to be the stem cell in the bone marrow that produces all the formed elements. So there are going to be different growth factors um, that are going to prompt the division and the differentiation of this hemopoietic stem cell. And these are called hemopoietic growth factors. There's a different hemopoietic growth factor for um, red blood cells, for the white blood cells, and for the platelets. Once a particular uh, hemopoietic stem cell has been uh, uh, acted on by one of these growth factors, that stem cell is going to st then stop being a clean slate and sort of enter a particular pathway and it's going to proceed in that one particular pathway. And once this happens, we refer to the hemopoietic stem cell as being a committed cell. It's committed to a particular pathway and there's no going back at that point. So what we're going to see is that hemopoietic stem cells can differentiate into all of the form elements. So let's look at this guy right here. So here we have a hemopoietic stem cell. So if the hemopoietic stem cell is divides, it can form one of two what are referred to as progenitor cells. Um, and they're going to be the beginning of this longer pathway. Um, the first is going to be a myeloid cell, stem cell, and the other one is going to be a lymphoid stem cell. 
from the myeloid stem cell, we are going to be able to produce our erythrocytes, our thrombocytes, which are our erythrocytes, remember our red blood cells. Thrombocytes are gonna be our platelets. We also are gonna be able to produce a lot of different leukocytes or white blood cells. And those in particular that, that come from the myeloid stem cell are going to be our monocytes, our neutrophils, our eosinophils, and our basophils. I'm going to go through the pathway of each individual one of these, but I'm just giving you a very quick overview right now. So we have our hemopoietic stem cells. It can either become a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell. If it becomes a myeloid stem cell, from that myeloid stem cell, we are going to get the mature red blood cell or erythrocyte, thrombocyte or the platelets, and we're going to get one, two, three, four, four different types of leukocytes or white blood cells. That's going to be the monocyte, which is a leukocyte or white blood cell, eosinophil, neutrophil, and basophil. All of these also are classified as leukocytes or white blood cell. If that hemopoietic stem cell becomes a lymphoid stem cell, the lymphoid stem cell is going to go forward to produce a type of lymphocyte called, well, a, a type of leukocyte or white blood cell called a lymphocyte. And there's three different types of lymphocytes. There's B lymphocyte, T lymphocyte, and my favorite and my son's favorite, the natural killer cell, which just sounds like horrific, but <laughs> that's the name of it. I don't, I don't know who named that one. Good job though, by the way, whoever named that, the natural killer cell. All right, we're going to stop here. When we come back, we're going to pick up with the first specific type of hemopoiesis. It's erythropoiesis. Erythro, you should already know that means red. So that's going to be the production of red blood cells. Stop sharing.